Hello, and welcome to our event on Moving Forward Careers in Disaster and Emergency Management. My name is Eric Kennedy, and I'm an assistant professor in the Disaster and Emergency Management program here at York University. It's part of the School of Administrative Studies in the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies. Thank you so much for joining us today. It always means a great deal when you take time out of your day to join with us in Zoom land. And I'm really confident that this hour will be chock full of insights into different career paths and journeys <clears throat> in emergency management. A special welcome to our guest panelists as well. You'll be hearing more from them and introductions from them shortly. As we gather here virtually today, we're all joining from different places and different spaces. I myself am currently situated in Southern Alberta, the traditional territory of the Siksika, Guyana, Pekani, Stony Nakoda, and Sutina nations. In addition, it's home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3, within the historical Northwest Métis homeland. So if, like me, you're joining from places other than York University, I'd ask that you take a moment to acknowledge the traditional territory that you are joining from and its current treaty holders. And given that we're coming together today as a York community, I also want to recognize that many Indigenous nations have longstanding relationships with the territories upon which York University campuses are located that precede the establishment of the university. York acknowledges its presence on the traditional territory of many Indigenous nations. The area known as Takaranto has been care taken by the Anishinaabek Nation, the Haudenosaunee Confederacy, and the Huron-Wendat. It's now home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis communities. We also acknowledge the current treaty holders, the Mississauga of the Credit First Nation. The territory is subject to the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Convention, an agreement to peaceably share and care for our Great Lakes region. And so welcome again to guests and to everyone joining us on Zoom to the special event in the Moving Forward webinar series. During this panel, we're going to hear from graduates of the Faculty of Liberal Arts and Professional Studies who are responsible for managing disasters and emergencies, such as hydro grids growing down, fighting fires, responding to flooding, and all sorts of other natural hazards and disasters. They are here today to share their journeys and to provide some great advice and tips on what to expect in this ever-changing and exciting and challenging industry of disaster and emergency management. If at any time during this panel you need help with the experience or have questions for the panelists about the content, I'd really encourage you to click on the Q&A button in the bottom of your screen. We're eager to hear your questions and I'm very excited to see uh, what answers we can get from the group. And so now what I'd like to do is to introduce our panelists. Uh, our first panelist is Ben Panton, who will introduce himself briefly now. Thanks for that, Eric. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Ben Panton. I'm a supervisor of distribution grid operations at Toronto Hydro. I manage a rotating shift of controllers and operators, maybe a staff of around 20. Uh, they work a 24 seven shift. And our primary role is to balance the grid. So if you, if you go back to the ice storm, when we were losing a lot of power, there's a lot of work that goes on behind the scenes to make sure that um, we can bring it back on. I graduated from uh, the master's program in adjust disaster and emergency management back in 2009. Thanks so much, Ben. Uh, our next speaker today is Darren Rizzi. Hi there, my name is Darren Rizzi. I'm the Fire Chief of Mississauga Fire and Emergency Services, and I also serve as the Director of Emergency Management. Um, my team is approximately 741 people. Uh, it's divided into a number of different divisions. So there's the Operations Division, the um, administration division, our fire prevention and life safety division, our professional development and accreditation division, our capital asset division, our emergency management division. Um, so a lot of people that help the uh, fire service run and ensure um, the safety of our citizens. I also am a graduate uh, for the Masters of Disaster and Emergency Management. Incredibly impressive portfolio so far. Uh, our next panelist is Joe Gagliano. Uh, thank you, Eric. Sorry about the technical there. I'm just learning uh, the, the tech from Zoom. Um, I'm uh, Joe Gagliano. I'm the uh, CEO of uh, Access Restoration Services. 
Uh, I run a company of approximately 300 employees and uh, my main objective is our, our growth throughout Canada with um, emergency and disaster planning for insurance companies, uh, property management companies, and uh, banks and um, other uh, large ent entities throughout Canada. We've also expanded into the US and we're in four states in the US as well. Um, and we do uh, um, approximately over $100 million in sales. And um, uh, most of our work is commercial uh, work that we do uh, since, uh, since we've started. Um, I graduated from the Faculty of Arts in 1991, uh, so it's a little while ago. And I, I also have my um, uh, BBA in business uh, through York as well. So I, I thank you for the experience and, and thank you for having me today. Joe, it's a delight to have you. And thank our you. final panelist here is Nicole Poulin. Thanks, Eric, and hi, everyone. My name is Nicole and I'm a Foreign Service Officer with Global Affairs Canada. Um, this is Canada's diplomatic service, um, so uh, we're officers that are hired uh, here in Canada, but we represent Canada uh, overseas as well and usually alternate between Canadian missions abroad, so at embassies, high commissions or consulates, as well as uh, working um, here in Ottawa, where I find myself today. Um, I'm currently leading a team responsible for Canada's foreign policy interests as it relates to international crime and counterterrorism, and previously have worked at the Canadian embassies in Mexico and the Dominican Republic. I'm a graduate of the York uh, Master's Program in Disaster and Emergency Management, and I also did a graduate certificate in International and Security Studies. Thanks. Thanks so much. And I am so grateful to all of you for taking the time. Uh, you clearly do an incredible amount in your roles. And so uh, your willingness to share with us today is very much appreciated. Now, those descriptions of, of what your job entails are really interesting, but I'm wondering if you can put it in a little bit more practical terms for us. So can you tell us a little bit more about what your role involves or, or maybe what kind of work you do on a day-to-day -day basis in that capacity? For simplicity's sake, we'll run in the same order here. Uh, so Ben, would you like to start us off? For sure. Thanks, Eric. Let's see. If, does anyone remember the big power outage back in 2003, where the entire Northeast grid lost power? And that's because North America, Canada, and the US there is connected in what we call a bulk power system. And when you lose a specific asset, if you don't sectionalize it, um, if you don't keep it away from the rest of the grid, it will pull the rest of the grid down. So our role in, in grid operations is to ensure there's that balance of power. So if I can take you back to your physics 101, energy is neither created or destroyed, it's merely transferred. Um, that's what we do to ensure that the grid stays up. Um, some of our smaller roles that we do as well is that if you don't pay your bills, I'm going to disconnect you. And I can also reconnect you once you repay your bill. Um, so yes, everything involving uh, electricity, both the primary and the secondary side of the grid. Uh, I manage a team that ensures that makes that happen for Torontonians. Fantastic. Thank you. Darren, tell us about what you do on a day-to-day -day basis with that incredible area of responsibility. So as a fire chief and the director of emergency management, I work on efforts to increase fire safety, fire prevention, and emergency uh, management mitigation efforts and we do that through education and prevention mechanisms and then also i'm in charge of overseeing the team's performance as it relates to providing a high quality efficient and effective emergency response so that our safe uh, the safety of the citizens you know is, is protected um, i also oversee the critical initiatives and and i know that this sounds very like high level and strategic but what you need to understand is a fire service for example has um, a budget an operating budget of 131 million annually and uh, the capital projects that we work on well for the next 10 years is just over 250 million dollars so when i talk at a very high level it's because um, i have people that work on those projects and my job really is to oversee all of those projects on a day to day thanks so much uh Joe. Yes, thank you. Um, so basically our um, our company is called in to handle some of the larger uh, disasters that occur 
uh, within the country with a lot of uh, numerous uh, facilities. And one scenario that I can share or, or two really quickly is one um, where we, uh, there was a, uh, I'm not sure if you recall a fire that seemed to have uh, been initially thought a terrorist uh, attack down on, uh, King, on King Street about three years ago. And what it was, was an explosion that occurred in, in an electrical vault. So uh, Ben would probably know the scenario. And what, what occurred was a set of circumstances that were um, um, almost from a, a scene or a, a clip from Final Destination, where the fire occurred in the vault and then it burned slowly overnight through the wiring cable going into one of the largest banks in Canada. And what occurred was that once it transferred its heat through the rubber, it then uh, caused transformers within a vault room within the bank to catch fire. Um, it displaced, once the fire started, it displaced uh, 2,000 employees and um, um, uh, it sent um, uh, PCBs and other very harsh chemicals throughout 13 floors in one of the largest banks. One of the biggest factors wasn't just the fact that um, uh, 2,000 employees got dispersed, but um, one of the largest vaults in Canada where all uh, the gold bullion for um, the major banks and the Bank of Canada were being held. Uh, approximately $10 billion uh, was uh, being stored down there. So we were uh, um, uh, put in to not move it, but to clean it. And then it was relocated. And there was also approximately $400 million worth of cash being dispersed out of that vault um, on a weekly basis. And there was uh, a, a time at that moment uh, for that week where you couldn't go to the bank and pull out more than a thousand dollars. No one knew why it's just because there was a cash shortage and our, our crews were also asked to clean the money so it could go back through the system because it was full of soap, soot. And uh, we were able to, uh, I, well, from what I was told, stop a major um, uh, economic uh, uh, scenario in, in Canada that month. So it was a quite unique situation. And a, another quick scenario that we did, there was a major flood in 2016 at uh, our largest airport, and we were entrusted to uh, deal with um, over 18 buildings that were flooded through a major storm that uh, occurred. And uh, we were able to stop the shutdown of the airport um, by attaching computers to the underside of the ceiling while we cleaned the soot and the mud that occurred in their main uh, transformer room, as well as their computer room. So those are some of the scenarios that we've had. I have a lot more amazing stories, but that's what we do. That's fantastic. And I will admit that I didn't expect to be talking about laundering money for good today. So <laughs> I appreciate the illustration. And yeah, I think no problem. Uh, all and three funny of you story so far. Is, uh, they actually had an Italian launder money. So if anyone can do a good job at it <laughs> in, in uh, a good way, yes. I was really struck with the, the comments so far about the interdisciplinarity of all of this too, the kinds of, of different collaborations that you have to have, the connections between your stories so far. And I think yeah. that will be a recurring theme throughout our conversation. Uh, Nicole, do you want to, to wind us up with what things look like at Global Affairs? Sure. And, um, you know, we're, I've been quite lucky to have a variety of different assignments. So the way that the, um, the job is sort of structured is that you get to cycle through different assignments every couple of years. So I've been able to work in a variety of different areas as well as kind of geographic regions. Um, I think for this audience, in terms of disaster and emergency management, um, kind of a day-to-day -day side of things, um, for those who've traveled abroad, if you've ever lost a passport or needed any other types of assistance, hopefully you haven't been arrested overseas, but if you have, then you would have come in contact um, with Canadian Consular Service overseas. So that's providing emergency and regular assistance to Canadians when they're living or traveling. Um, it can also look like responding to international emergencies and disasters as they happen. Um, and so for me, I've responded to uh, a few earthquakes. So the Haiti earthquake, as well as uh, the Japan earthquake and tsunami, I was deployed there. Um, and then most recently, actually, when I was posted in Mexico was uh, during the um, the 2017 earthquake uh, there. So a lot of interesting um, aspects of kind of being at the forefront of both kind of assisting Canadians as well as promoting, defending and advocating for Canadian um, interests in, in a foreign country. And then in Ottawa, there's a variety of assignments. I'm currently, uh, like I said, more responsible on the policy side of things um, on a portfolio that's related to transnational organized crime and terrorism. So a day-to-day -day 
um, you know, pre-pandemic, we were traveling quite a bit. Uh, I work quite quite a lot multilaterally, so within the United Nations system, as well as other uh, kind of multilateral and regional forums to promote and advocate uh, Canadian interests. I also work quite a bit with Public Safety Canada and its portfolio agencies, so RCMP and CBSA and others, um, on these files of uh, counterterrorism policy and transnational organized crime policy. Thanks so much. And I think one of the things that this panel really represents so well is the range of possible pathways that people can take, including government roles from federal to municipal, but also private sector utilities, lots of different places where there is a, a real need for people who can not just apply emergency management, uh, but also use the transferable skills that you're picking up in terms of being able to be calm and collected in crisis and communicate effectively. There are really endless kinds of roles. Now, I'd like to remind everyone, uh, I have a million questions, but I'd really like to hear yours. So please use the Q&A function to share questions that you would like to have asked of the panelists, whether it's directed to one panelist in particular or for everyone. Um, feel free to share any thoughts or questions you have via the Q&A feature, and we'll try our best to get those answered. As we allow people some time to share their cues, their questions in, I'm wondering if uh, we could sort of situate your journey a little bit. Can you tell us about how you ended up at York and how you ended up following the path that you did? So I know we've had people here who have, have been part of York at different stages of their career, whether that's for a bachelor's degree or coming back for a master's. So what led you to York? And then how did you sort of carve your way forward um, from that experience uh, at York University? Ben, would you like to start us off or are there others who would like to jump in? Sure, I can start us off, Eric. So uh, I started at York University looking to do actuarial science. Then I changed to biology or something like that. And then I changed again to history. And then after realizing that I didn't really have much of a direction on the advice of, of an uncle um, back from the Caribbean, where I'm originally from, I got into this thing called emergency management, thinking it was health and safety that I would get into the oil and gas sector. Uh, so that tells you how much I didn't know. And I wonder if I can relate to a lot of the students here because of that. Um, and then after joining the program, I realized, oh, this is something completely new, a whole new world. I'm flying on a magic carpet. And uh, I got into the master's program after doing the undergraduate at York University. And then from there, I met um, a very influential professor who, who gave me a shot. I worked for free, but uh, I took a shot at the city of Brampton and I worked for him for a little while, which led me to an opportunity with Hydro One Brampton. And uh, there, through some connections and networking, I, I spoke with the control room manager who said, Ben, nobody is doing the sort of work that you're doing, especially in the utility business. And so I stuck it out there, uh, moved on to the, the province, worked for the, the provincial government for a while, then landed at Toronto Hydro, uh, did emergency planning for five years there and then interestingly after that I, I got tired of emergency planning and I wanted to do something different and so I went and I did a degree in electrical engineering and so you know I think there's one thing I can add value um, for anybody who wants to ask is that it, there really is an opportunity to branch out and do different things because you choose one career path or one role in academia it doesn't mean that you can't branch out right and so now the last uh, four years and doing operations, hands-on work in electrical engineering and, and quite enjoying it. That's fantastic. I, I often really encourage students to think about how they can pair their DEM degree with another degree or a minor or a double major, because I think that really positions you to have a niche, right? Have this intersection of different things where you're a, an incredible expert and can work across those areas. And I think your story there is a, an awesome example. Darren, would you like to tell us a, a bit about how you came to York and how York influenced your journey? Absolutely. I think everyone comes to a, a juncture in their career where they start to look at their roles and responsibilities, and perhaps they're a little bit disillusioned in the place that they are in life, and they're looking for other uh, alternatives. Maybe it's a career change or just a change in their current role. And at that particular time, I was a frontline firefighter and I decided to go back to school. And so I applied to York, the master's program, and I actually 
um, I didn't necessarily get rejected, but I was on the waiting list and I was super fortunate. I think it was probably three days before class started. I got the email and the phone call saying that there's a spot available. Would you like to take it? And I remember showing up on campus and I was probably 36 at the time, 36 years old, right? And there was a lot of students on campus, young students with their parents. And I was thinking to myself, what am I getting myself into? But certainly, I, I can't say it enough, the, uh, the degree has opened so many doors for me, um, not only, you know, academically to move forward into a PhD, but also Obviously, in my my current role, I think it was incredibly helpful to compete um, for positions that I've been able to move through. So that's how I got to York University, and I'm very thankful. I, I I did, you know, stop at that juncture and think and look at my options and chose the option to go to York. Thanks so much, and and I just want to express how grateful I am for students who come in to the classroom via these pathways. I think it's one of the things that makes our, our program really exciting is the opportunity, not just to learn from the professors, but from each other. Um, and so the experience that you're able to bring um, with that background, I think makes you such a valuable candidate. So I'm glad you were scared off from that, that initial experience on campus. Joe, what about you? Can you tell us a bit about how your path evolved to where you are now? Um, yes, so it basically was more of a, um, a situation where I had siblings that were, went to York and it was just a comfort zone for me. And uh, I've heard a lot of uh, amazing things about the university. It was uh, definitely at that point in time, an up and coming place and um, uh, a great social uh, network for me as well. Cause I had some friends from school that also went there. Um, I was looking initially to actually go into law and uh, took some of the programs going into that direction. Uh, but I changed paths and uh, I didn't find it as interesting as I did um, the arts program. Um, and one of my professors, because uh, prior to this, I was, um, I was working for my dad in construction and uh, I was working from the, the young old age of 10 years old where my dad would bring me to the office and sweep the back and learn how to organize materials for the men in the morning. And uh, so, um, uh, Fast forward, um, I was initially going to go into law and then or poss possibility into um, a commerce program that would uh, allow me to work for one of the big banks that looked to hire me in my final year. And I didn't think to work with my dad. Uh, I thought I'm done com with construction, but um, one of my professors thought I had a great uh, ability to engage people and saying, why don't I use my skills that I learned in construction to, uh, uh, work with my dad because that's a great uh, opportunity. And with that, I ended up um, starting with communications and, and marketing and um, grew our company from four employees to where we are now. And um, and uh, the funny part is it's, it's wild to see some of the people that uh, were at York now because we're actually the restoration emergency contractor for York University. And uh, We've handled a number of fires and floods uh, for the university for the past three years. Um, so exciting times, but that's my brief story and uh, exciting times. And it led me on to my path where I am today. I'm, and I'm very grateful. Thanks, Joe. And, and I think for a lot of us, those kinds of personal experiences and, and interests are a valuable source of inspiration for possible directions to try out. Nicole, Thanks, there is a lot of enthusiasm to hear about your path in the Q&A. So um, can you tell us a bit more about uh, what led you to your master's study and, and forward from it and the programs that you studied along the way? Sure. Um, I can actually kind of relate to both Ben and Darren in terms of kind of that path. Um, I had in my undergrad, I, I studied at the University of Ottawa. I also changed my degree multiple times before finally graduating with a Bachelor of Arts. Um, I, I didn't know what a diplomat was kind of growing up. It wasn't really something that I had ever really thought about. But when in, when I was in my third year, I studied abroad um, and was trying to find a way of how, how might I be able to find a, a job that kind of paid me to travel um, and, you know, kind of came across the foreign service exams that way and, and, and got in. Um, I, you know, if, if you go forward a couple of years, um, my first posting was in the Dominican Republic in Santo Domingo. Uh, and I was responsible for the consular section there, very busy job. But three months into my posting was the earthquake in neighboring Haiti. 
And so uh, for about a year of my life, um, you know, we were responding both kind of in the immediate uh, kind of front lines of evacuating Canadians. Um, a lot of that happened through the Dominican Republic, given the extens extensive damage on, uh, on the other side of the island in Haiti um, because of that experience. And this was also kind of pre, um, before the Global Affairs Canada instituted a lot of systems and procedures, things like incident command structure, all of that kind of stuff didn't really exist at this time. Um, but based on that experience, when the earthquake and tsunami hit in Japan, um, I was sent there, I was deployed to our embassy in Tokyo to work there for about a month. And so I was really struck in, by the difference in terms of, you know, on one hand in Haiti, you have, um, I forget the magnitude of the earthquake, but the, the earthquake and the tsunami in Japan was actually quite a bit stronger. And yet, um, both kind of the, the amount of damage as well as the response mechanisms, both domestic and international, were just so different. And so I was really interested, um, having had this experience, to really kind of dive into these issues more. So I had always known that I wanted to go back and do a master's degree. I just wasn't really sure what. Um, a natural progression usually in this line of work is doing something in international affairs or political science. Uh, I had kind of done some interviews with some of the schools, um, but it, I, I found it a little too generic and not as specialized as I had wanted to do. Um, I was also interested uh, because York, well, at that time, and I think it still is, is one of the few programs in Canada that offers a master's degree uh, in disaster management. And I was also quite interested in, in being able to take different electives kind of more on the political science side of things um, and to be able to do a, a graduate certificate or a graduate diploma at the same time um, in the political science department in international and security studies. So it really allowed me to kind of focus my research in on that intersection between kind of humanitarian um, uh, assistance, uh, security uh, and the foreign policy. And so that's what, what drew me to York. Thanks so much, Nicole. And, and if I can just follow up real quickly here, uh, there's a great question in the, the chat from Rihanna, uh, wondering about what it looks like to actually work in these contexts. So are you on the ground with uh, global affairs staff doing this kind of work? Are you largely in the government operations center or somewhere else coordinating resources like the disaster assistance response team? What, what does responding to these kinds of events actually look like in a, a practical way? So it can be kind of all of those things. Um, so for instance, the earthquake in Haiti, uh, we were in the Dominican Republic, but we set up kind of a temporary uh, operations kind of office at the airport where we received the, the first of the, the military um, jets that brought Canadians out and we had to provide them with assistance. So we're really kind of on the front lines. Um, same with when we're responding uh, the, the earthquake in Mexico as well, um, kind of living, working in Mexico City, which was the epicenter of the earthquake, you are dealing with Canadians. Um, as well as kind of foreign governments in terms of what that disaster response looks like. Um, pivoting a little bit from to the Ottawa side of things, so the headquarters, um, there is a 24 hour, uh, it's called the Emergency Watch and Response Center. And so that's kind of the, the op center uh, for all of our global operations. And I have been, even though I don't work there anymore, um, just after my master's, I did work on the policy side of things. So it was actually uh, great to be able to you know, spend a couple of years thinking and, and, and really doing a lot of research on these types of issues and then actually being able to kind of help shape some of, uh, you know, the policy around how we respond to international emergencies. Um, and so that is uh, the, the nerve center in terms of all of the planning, the logistics, um, answering calls, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, and most recently in the COVID response, um, if you'll remember that at, at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, when borders were shut quite suddenly, there were uh, tens of thousands or if not more uh, Canadians who found themselves kind of stuck in in other locations outside of Canada and so including on, on cruise ships and all of that kind of stuff so I was deployed to the emergency ops uh, center for about a month or so and I was the uh, the planning chief uh, there. That is just fascinating and I'm incredibly jealous of those experiences. Um, we do have a number of questions on the same theme coming in, and I think this is a very relatable theme for many of the, uh, the folks attending and listening today. And this is how intimidating and unclear it can be to figure out how you make that link in, to get your foot in the door to find those first opportunities. So I'm wondering if our panelists might be willing to weigh in on this question of, of how you sort of open that door up 
for the first couple of positions? How do you get your, your foot in the door with a new company uh, or establish the new relationships? It's one thing to scour the job postings, but what else can students be thinking about or, or doing beyond that? Is there anyone who would like to offer a, a first thought on that question? Yeah, Darren. I think it's really important to take a look at the job posting or your ideal um, job that you're looking for and really understand the competencies required for that position. Um, and then once you've figured out the competencies, you have to go through and, and to really understand and map out how you're going to articulate how the, your previous experiences align with the competencies required. I think that's that's the hardest part for a lot of people is really being able to demonstrate that. So then take a step back. How are you then developing those competencies to be able to have something to bring to the table? So that might be writing for magazines. So whether that's practitioner type magazines or academic journals, um, you, can, uh, you can volunteer to be speakers at conferences, um, networking opportunities, those types of things, but really you have to be able to bring something to the table and you have to be able to articulate it and you have to be able to set yourself um, apart from other um, candidates. So the best thing to do also is to take a look perhaps at people's LinkedIn profiles um, and, and say for example in Nicole's you'll go into Nicole's and see you'll be able to see a history of what she's worked on whether it's education or her life experiences and everyone's path is a labyrinth meaning that it it doesn't it's not a linear path it's not a straight path but you can get ideas from the routes that other people have taken yeah that's fantastic I think um paying attention to some of the transferable skills is so critical because when we have you doing different kinds of assignments, that's not just for the, the completion of the class, but to try and uh, give you things that you can use in your interviews to say, yeah, I wrote a policy brief or I did a mock press conference. Um, and then your point, Darren, there about the requirements. I mean, my guess is that Nicole would really second this particularly in government jobs, how critical it is to be paying attention to what the posting is looking for and articulating those attributes with very practical examples. So I think that's just awesome advice. Ben, I know you had something to add there too. I think when, when we talk about getting our foot in the door, it seems like this sort of grand step up. And I would ask the students to think about it in small pieces, small achievable pieces. So just like what Darren was saying, what are your achievements? What have you brought to the table? And getting a master's degree or graduating from school does not entitle you to the next interview at the city of Mississauga or at Global Affairs Canada. It, it, it gives you the skill sets that you have to start making something of it now. So wherever you are, it's not about fighting to get it to the next organization. Stay where you are and build something, achieve something, right? And from there, you will get noticed. You'll get recognized. If you put this up on LinkedIn, if you go to the conferences, like Darren was saying, um, so, so focus on that. Don't, don't worry too much about the next big move or the next big jump. Wherever you are now, leverage the network um, and the opportunities you have there and go with it. You wouldn't believe the sort of things we see in organizations um, that are very small, achievable things. And I'll give you one quick example. I, I was helping to manage the ice storm back in 2013, where we lost something like 60% of our load, half of Torontonians without power over Christmas. And the executive team was coming to me with little pieces of paper of numbers of other executives for other utilities saying, call this guy, you might be able to get 10 more crews to come and help us. So can you imagine that like half the city of Toronto is without power and we don't have a system to network ourselves as utilities to say, how are we going to share resources to bring power back on? So just that very small increment of, hey, why don't we get everyone together and start talking about um, a mutual assistance group? and sharing everyone's phone numbers so it's not done informally on pieces of paper behind the scenes is one very small achievable win that, that I don't need to move to another big company to get to. Thanks so much, Ben. Nicole or Joe, did you want to add anything or, or should I add a spin to the question from one of the Q&A's here? 
Well, let me just add that extra little angle because I think there's a great question here from Joshua in the chat. Um, Joshua is asking about this phenomenon of, of who you know, right? And building the relationships. Because you come from such different sectors, I'm wondering if you can tell me a bit about what building relationships and, and building that professional identity looks like in your field or in your area. Um, what are some of the tools or techniques that might be important, like conferences or informational interviews or internships or networking? What are those techniques in, in your particular domain? And what would you advise a, an early career student do in terms of starting to build their professional identity and some of that uh, professional networking? Um, I might add something um, I, I, as uh, as Ben mentioned and and uh, Darren as well. I think the uh, going to the conferences and uh, we have trade shows as well in our in our field. Um, you get to meet the companies that are out there and that could um, maybe uh, tweak your interest in in what what we do. Um, and I think in any environment, and you you get the gist for what is out there and what you might be encompassed with. And you'll you'll be speaking to a lot of uh, people that I would say uh, are highly skilled and have a lot of um, experience in the field. So it'll, it, you'll understand through your communications with them that uh, this might be a field that you might be interested or what do I need to step in the door to tweak uh, um, uh, someone in HR of a particular company. So those are just some of the experiences that I've seen. And that's how we've hired some of our better people where we've been approached at our conferences and trade shows um, and um, and based off of their interest and seeing them um, not in an, an interview environment, but seeing them face to face on a sort of regular um, person to person uh, experience, um, we were able to sort of uh, select some people that we thought were quite interesting and could add to our company. As a venue, we don't often think about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Darren, I saw you unmute as well. What did you want to add? Um, so it's interesting. At one point in time, I went to a different academic institution to watch a speaker talk about a quadrilateral exercise. And I thought it was so fascinating. So it was four countries coming together to do an emergency management exercise. And at the end of it, I just emailed him and I said, whenever you're coming back to Toronto, I would love to listen to you if you're presenting again. And so um, months later, he emailed me and said, I'm coming back to Toronto. This is what I'm speaking about. And this is where I'm speaking. And it was just happened to be at a time when I was doing my master's and I had arranged for a co-op opportunity um, to be working for an organization. Quite honestly, they had me doing some tasks like filing and, and these sorts of things that, you know, wasn't really developing my skills or, or the way that I wanted my skills to be developed. And when he came into town, um, he was with the Department of Foreign Affairs and International Trade. He said himself and, and four team members were going abroad to teach incident command at different uh, consulates. And so I ended up going with the team as part of my uh, master's program. And um, it's not co-op, I forget what is a practical placement. Um, and so I went to India, Indonesia, and Malaysia, and um, was able to help the team teach incident command skills for 16 days. So it was a phenomenal opportunity, and it just happened out of an email after watching somebody present and then keeping that connection going. So I really encourage that as well. Yeah, I, that's great advice. And I think out of it, I mean, it reminds me of a couple of things. One is is grabbing onto any opportunity that you have to go to talks, to reach out to people, to, um, to, to take the chances, even if there's not an immediate lineup, it might help to spur some of those connections. The other thing is just how genuine your connection there was, right? To be really sincere and appreciative of, of people. I think that that kind of character and integrity can go a long way in making the kind of impression that you want as well. Nicole, working with the federal government has a totally different pathway as to how you get into it. What, what advice would you give about uh, students who want to pursue provincial or federal careers? 
Sure. Uh, well, I can speak to the federal side. I'm not totally sure how the provincial side works, um, but there's a, uh, so many different avenues into the federal uh, public service. So I kind of went in on the, I, I guess, the more kind of traditional post-secondary recruitment of, of the foreign service. So that's, um, you know, you write some exams, there's, there's some interviews. It's quite a lengthy process. It used to happen once a year. Now it's a little bit less frequent. Um, but that's still an option. And actually, uh, unfortunately, it just kind of closed uh, a few weeks ago, but it is something to look into if this line of work is of interest. But there's also a number of other ways forward. The first is through, you know, jobs.gc.ca. And, and normally, actually, Global Affairs Canada has a kind of ongoing recruitment for the Emergency Watch and Response Centre. Um, most of those positions do require uh, bilingualism. And so I would, I would strongly encourage, you know, uh, regardless of the position or anything, if you are interested in working in government, that being able to be uh, kind of officially bilingual, and, and it's not like you have to be entirely fluent, but there's different levels, but working on, on your second language uh, or third language for those um, who, who might know other languages is always a good bet. The other thing like previous panelists have said is, you know, kind of those connections that you make either um, kind of through various events or um, kind of, you know, different conferences and that kind of thing, um, or even co-op uh, can often kind of turn themselves into positions. And so there is a little bit more, as a manager in the public service, there is a little bit more flexibility, whether that's hiring co-op students or kind of shorter term contracts. Um, and I know quite a few people who've gotten in, um, you know, first through either a co-op or um, a, a, what they call a casual or a term employment, so that's just shorter term assignments. And then that kind of gets your foot in the door, you get a little bit more experience and you can apply on um, kind of uh, indeterminate positions kind of within the government. And there's all kinds of positions um, within the federal government that look at emergency management, um, you know, obviously Public Safety Canada and the various portfolio agencies um, are, are, are a good place as well. Um, but I would say pretty much every department does have um, some sort of emergency management function, uh, whether that's domestic or, or international. And so there's so many options there. Thanks so much. I love to geek out about the government jobs that are, are available and the pathways to them. So that kind of detail, I think is really helpful to students. There's an awesome question in the chat from uh, Shi Yuan. Uh, asking about the relationship between master's programs and undergraduate programs. So many of you have had experience doing undergrad programs, professional certificates, graduate studies. I'm wondering if you can reflect a little bit upon uh, how those worked or didn't together um, and advice that you might have for people who are currently in undergrad and thinking about a master's or um, who are thinking about coming back for additional certifications or, or things like that. What kind of advice would you have in thinking about those different kinds of degrees and where to fit them into your journey? Please, Darren. Uh, so in regards to my undergrad, uh, that was a Bachelor of Arts and Bachelor of Education. So no real direct connection to a master's of disaster and emergency management. Um, but again, I, I would say my experience in undergrad versus master's is so different and you just you get to know your profs in a master's program so much better and i can't i don't know how long it's been since we've graduated nicole is it 10 years now i'm a little bit nervous to say that no, not quite 20 okay okay so almost, you know, if we're rounding up. So it's been a long time, but I can honestly say two of my profs I still keep in touch with. Um, so that's phenomenal. And in regards to my my colleagues, and and Nicole was one of my my colleagues when I was at, at school. Just as as you mentioned, um, Eric people come from so many um, different backgrounds in terms of what they're doing for work or what they're doing in, vol in vol volunteer or paid work, um, their schooling, they just bring so much to the table and the conversations that we would have in class were so enlightening and inspiring. The people that I went to school with were so inspiring. Um, so I just found the difference. If you're in undergrad right now and you're unsure of whether you want to do a master's, it's hard to imagine how different it is, but it's such a great experience. Yeah, please, Nicole. 
I could jump in there too. And I saw um, a question in the chat about taking time off. I think, I mean, that's a very personal decision, but I think I benefited tremendously from taking time off between my undergraduate and my graduate degree. Uh, I switched um, degrees multiple times in my undergrad, finally ended up with a Bachelor of Arts degree. Um, so not a ton of link, direct links to the emergency management um, side of things. Um, but having had kind of the experience that I did, um, that was what really, I think, gave me um, uh, the, the, the drive to, to really want to um, study it in greater detail, as well as, um, you know, the, the motivation to do it. So for me, it was really um, taking that time off and being able to, uh, to decide what it was that I actually wanted to do and what I was interested in and, and you know, really kind of uh, diving in pretty deep. On, on, on that front. Um, for me, I was, uh, you know, more interested on the policy side of things. So like I had previously said, I took a number of courses, um, kind of more in the political science side of things, as well as at Glendon College. Um, so I found that to be really kind of helpful in terms of rounding out um, some of the, the, the courses that are in the emergency management um, program. And so, you know, I would also say for government type positions, um, you know, a lot of the policy work does require a bit of a background um, or at least being able to demonstrate some coursework in terms of uh, sociology or economics or uh, research methods, statistics and that kind of stuff. So, um, you know, maybe just kind of keeping an eye on, on those types of requirements for the types of jobs that you're looking for. Um, and trying to match that with, uh, with, with the course options and, you know, kind of fitting in whatever electives you, you decide to choose um, kind of along those, those lines of interest as well as um, kind of the requirements for the position. Absolutely, thank you. Ben. I would, you know, the graduate degree is gonna help you focus on something. Um, my path is sort of different because I ended up going straight into a master's program, not knowing what it is that I wanted to do, just enjoying emergency planning and emergency management. And only after working in the electricity sector, my focus then became electrical engineering. And then I got into that as a, as a second career, as a second degree. Um, so, so if you're thinking about a graduate program, I think it's fantastic. I think you will get the most value out of it if you know what it is specifically you want to study. So like Nicole was saying, you will start choosing your electives, you will start attending um, lectures, uh, conferences, um, choosing to, to expand your network specifically on what it is because you are very interested in that thing. Um, so it definitely it was helpful for me. My, my, my course was a little bit backwards now, but um, it's not to say that it's right or wrong, right? That's super helpful. And, and I think it's important to remember that um, especially in the first three years of an undergrad program, it's all about the breadth, right? Going wide, trying to show you the field as a whole. And as you progress deeper into the, the fourth year, but also into the master's and eventually PhD level, if you want to, that's where it really gets focused and you're drilling down into a particular topic. Um, and so I think, Ben, that that comment about um, sort of knowing what you're after so that you can maximize your time in the masters is is really quite valuable because that will let you tailor it the way you want to go. Joe, did you want to add in any thoughts about um, professional certifications or, or grad studies? Um, yes, I do. Um, so basically there are in, in our uh, in the uh, restoration uh, industry, we have uh, certifications that uh, uh, students can take. Uh, learning how to deal with, uh, um, we do have uh, disaster planning where we uh, do work for uh, directly for municipalities. So we would do work for the city of Toronto, city of Mississauga, uh, Brampton, uh, where we're called upon to uh, enable plans just in case there is a, a major storm and, and how to mitigate it. Um, we do have courses on how you can take um, and learn to deal with um, some of the results of, of the disasters that occur, like, like water. You've seen down in BC, our teams are responding to uh, a lot of the circumstances that are happening in BC. And um, again, you could install equipment as an example uh, um, and, and leave it there, but not understand the science behind why we have special drying techniques and equipment to minimize mold and, um, 
and deal with the issues that because uh, in a lot of cases, the homeowners or the uh, business owners are still uh, trying to live in the location as well as um, um, uh, continue to do a business. So um, there are some great courses out there and um, I would recommend uh, if people are interested in the field to uh, look them up and uh, and and if they wanted to, they could email me and I could send some or, or send some information back to the panel and and they could find out some of the courses that are out there, but definitely worth taking. Thanks so much, Joe. We're starting to come towards the end of our time together, and I have a couple of questions to summarize it all. But just before we get there, Adrian wanted to ask something of Darren, which was to get a little bit more information about how exactly the journey looks from frontline firefighter through to fire chief. Can you just demystify this a little bit for us? How did you end up in, in such an incredible role? Well, sometimes it's just um, being very fortunate with the people that you're working with. And, and certainly I had a, a chief that took a, a chance on me. So my my route was very different than most people in the fire service. Normally you have to be a firefighter. You move up to a captain, which I did. Um, and then you move into the role of district chief, which is very tactical, then platoon chief, and then into a deputy. But I went from straight from captain and I competed for a deputy uh, position and um, skipped district chief, platoon chief, and went right into um, a deputy chief. And at that particular time in the province, there were not many women in chief officer roles. And, and certainly moving from a captain's position to a deputy position was unheard of at that particular time. Um, so I was just very fortunate to have someone that believed in, in my skill set and um, and the rest is behind me, quite honestly. Thanks for that. And, and what an incredible journey. Um, as we come to the end here, I'm wondering if we can look back a little. I, I'm in a tiny little closet of an office here, and it makes me feel like I'm, I or wish I was inside a time machine. So if I could grant access to the time machine to you to go back to your studies, to go back to university with the knowledge you have now, is there anything you would do different? If you could go back and, and tweak a decision or change something about your time at York University, what would you adjust knowing what you know now? We're going to end on the easy questions, as you can tell here. I can I can talk. So certainly I went through my master's and, and start to finish, didn't take any breaks. But when I moved into um, a PhD, uh, what I did is I did all of the coursework and then I did the comprehensive exams and I took a break before my dissertation. And I think my break's been probably a couple of years now and I'm just petitioning to get back in. I have some support from professors to finish off my PhD. I would say once you've made a commitment to take on a program, do whatever you can to at least incrementally keep moving forward as opposed to taking large breaks. So if you cannot handle, say, two courses for a workload, drop down to one, but try not to drop down to zero because it just, that, that break in the middle makes it very difficult to keep going. What a useful perspective. Thank you, Darren. Joe, what advice would you have for your past self? You're on mute there. There we go. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Um, I think Darren hit the nail right on the head. Um, I would definitely continue on with at, at least taking as many courses as you as your workload would allow you to take. Um, I think sometimes that uh, I've seen uh, uh, friends and students uh, that have uh, decided to take a year or two off and then uh, unfortunately they get tied into the uh, the hustle and bustle of, uh, uh, of paying rent and then losing a little bit of focus and the interest. So I, I would definitely recommend to continue on with at least one course to keep you connected to the uh, university and the um, not lose focus and obtaining what you want to get from a degree perspective. Um, and, and as quickly as possible, try to get as much done as, as, as you can because time, time moves on very quickly and uh, life's very short. Thanks, Joe. Ben? You know, I don't regret 
the path I took at York University. And I think it's because I made those decisions. You know, I'm here and I'm very grateful for, for what I have. But hindsight is 2020. And so with that being said, if you do have the foresight, if you are privileged enough to know, um, I would do things in the reverse way. I would have gone back and done electrical engineering first and then taken uh, emergency management in my graduate degree in emergency planning. Um, specific to this field, it is a management system field. You, you are managing people, you're managing resources, you're managing governance systems, management systems. Um, and so that's a little bit higher up. I think, you know, when you have that expert knowledge at the ground level, like Darren was a firefighter or Nicole is um, boots on the ground or Joe is, is, is cleaning gold bullion. Um, then when you add that layer of management, here's how I manage those processes. Here's how I manage those people and those systems that keeps those things together. It will certainly enrich what it is um, that you want to achieve and without what it is you want to do in life. Thank you, Ben. We're coming up, Nicole, did you want to add in real quick there? Um, sure, yeah, I, I would just yeah. maybe say in my undergrad, you know, I, I mentioned I, I switched my degree multiple times. I think I felt really lost because I wasn't really sure what kind of um, path to go on. And I, I wouldn't say that kind of my career path up to now has been linear, um, kind of a common field or a common thread of all of that is to follow kind of the, the experiences and the, the areas of interest that really speak to you, that really kind of um, where, where you're super interested, because, you know, if, if you're interested and engaged in those areas, you're going to do a great job, you will be noticed. And so sometimes you're not sure of, of should I do this or should I do that is, is really also just kind of speaking to um, what really motivates you and uh, what type of work do you want to do? I always knew I wanted to do a, a job where I was helping people. Um, and I think I had a very narrow view of what that could look like, um, you know, being a doctor or, or something in the medical field um, and, and um, trying to find positions and areas of, of focus that, that really engage you and, and interest you and, and following those forward. I think is, is a good path, but I wouldn't necessarily change very much about my, my graduate uh, degree because I feel like by the time I, I arrived in my master's degree, I did have some experience in the maturity and I think a bit more self-awareness in terms of what that, that motivation was for me. Thanks so much. Darren. I was just having a conversation with someone yesterday just about a, a certain role. And I, I was advising this person, you know, the people in this role, and it doesn't matter what role we're talking about, um, they don't necessarily have better qualifications than you or, or better experiences than you. It's that person had the confidence to compete for that position. So I, I think that that's something to always keep in mind um, that you have to you have to put your name forward to be considered for different positions. So even though you may be happy in a position, if you're looking to move up or, or change opportunities, just keep your eye out on on what opportunities are out there. And, and don't ever sell yourself short uh, to take a chance and put put your name forward. What great advice to end on. I know there are a couple more questions in the chat that unfortunately we won't get a chance uh, to go through, but um, to the, the questions about volunteer opportunities and key certifications, all I would add is that our fabulous panelists are indeed on LinkedIn and in other venues where you uh, can look at their journeys and look at their backgrounds and their certifications and perhaps even reach out with a, a question or two there. So I'd encourage you to do exactly what Darren did, which was to do that background research, to look at their LinkedIn profiles and to find opportunities to connect with them there. Uh, I think the lessons that you four have shared have just been fantastic, uh, from the reassurance to not feel alone if you're still trying to figure out what it is you want to do and how, how your career will help you help people, um, to embracing nonlinear career paths. You don't need to feel like what you chose in grade 12 was exactly what you're going to have to do forever. And it's okay to seek out uh, new paths and new directions and to try things out and see if they work for you and the importance of embracing opportunity as well, right? To take those chances that come up, whether that's going to a talk and sending a thank you email afterwards or pursuing new certifications. Uh, I think all of this and more has been really great advice. 
So Ben, Nicole, Darren, Joe, I'm so grateful for your taking the time to be with us today and to provide such valuable advice and such honest perspectives of your own journeys and uh, how they've progressed. I'd encourage everyone attending to visit the LANPS website for more information about upcoming webinars and to register for our next webinar, uh, which is entitled No Regrets, How My Liberal Arts Degree Set Me Up for Success. That webinar will be in January on the 25th from 12.30 to 1.30 p.m. You can find that registration link down in the chat right now. And as always, lots more information awaits on the Liberal Arts and Professional Studies website under the Moving Forward Webinars webpage. And with that, let me just say thank you once again to our fabulous panelists. I've learned a ton and I think everyone else has too. Thanks so much. <laughs>